I am afraid, uh, and that's exactly the right word, I am afraid that we will have a crisis of confidence uh, against U.S. Treasuries that will cause the dollar to deteriorate enough that my gold sells for $8,000 or $9,000 or $10,000. Ben, that isn't the circumstance I look forward to. I don't own gold in hopes of capital gains. I own gold as a form of insurance. If you think about gold as insurance and you think about how you get paid on insurance, you get paid when something lousy happens. Life insurance means somebody died. Auto insurance means you had a wreck. House insurance means you had a fire or a theft. I don't want any of those things to occur, but if they do occur, I want to get paid. So I don't want to see a crisis in confidence around fiat currency denominated savings products. I don't want to see that. But I think that there's a possibility that it occurs. And given that there's a possibility that it occurs, and given that I can afford it, uh, I want insurance. I began systematically acquiring gold for the third time in my life in 1998. And in the period, well, 1998 was two years too early. You know, my, my, my first experience, well, my experience in this round of accumulation, my first two years, uh, I consistently lost purchasing power by purchasing gold. But in the period uh, 2000 to now, uh, that gold has appreciated for me against the U.S. dollar uh, by about 8%, 8.5% compounded, which is to say it's done its job. I've maintained my purchasing power in gold where I wouldn't have maintained my purchasing power in U.S. dollars. Uh, so gold has acted in my own portfolio precisely the way that I hoped it would act. Did you know that in times of crisis, gold prices can skyrocket to unimaginable heights? Rick Rule warns of a looming crisis of confidence in U.S. Treasuries that could cause the dollar to plummet, pushing gold prices to $8,000 or even $10,000 an ounce. In past liquidity crises like 1987 and 2008, gold initially held its ground and then snapped back, fulfilling its role as insurance. Rule emphasizes that owning gold isn't about capital gains, it's about safeguarding against economic disaster. As the US continues to weaponize the dollar and debase its value, the global shift away from the dollar accelerates, putting your savings at risk. Rule also highlights the alarming actions of the US government, such as the seizure of $300 billion in Russian assets, signaling to other nations that their assets aren't safe. This has led countries to seek alternatives to the dollar, further destabilizing its dominance. The fear is palpable, could we be on the brink of an economic catastrophe? The idea that they would build up large settlement balances with each other in non-convertible currencies is a non-starter. Um, they have been forced out of the U.S. dollar because the U.S. dollar has been weaponized by Washington. The enemy of the U.S. dollar is not in Beijing or Moscow or Riyadh. It's in Washington. Uh, the weaponizing of the SWIFT banking system, which is international, not American property. Uh, the theft by the United States government of $300 billion in Russian assets in U.S. treasuries. Whether or not you agree with Russia's policies uh, has let other countries know that to the extent that their internal policies are different from the policies preferred by the U.S. government, that the U.S. government will mechanize the medium of exchange uh, against them. Um, that's what the BRICS is about. Make no mistake, the BRICS currency will never be gold-backed. Uh, gold-backing a currency reduces the power of the politicians to affect their monetary goals. There's no politician on earth who ever entered politics to have his or her power constrained. <laughs> that just will not happen. Doug Casey famously says, the dollar is an IOU nothing. The euro, because of all the constituency, is a who owes you nothing. The BRICS threatens to be a nobody owes you anything uh, as it gets farther and farther distributed among more and more countries that don't themselves have uh, convertible currencies. Now, must the Chinese and the Russians find a mechanism of exchange between themselves outside the US dollar? Yes must the Chinese and the Saudis. But imagine that 
China ran in dollar equivalent terms, a trillion dollar surplus or some big surplus with the Russians. What do the Russians produce that the Chinese need? Natural gas and vodka? How much vodka are the Chinese going to consume? At the end of the day, they need an ongoing settlements mechanism so that the surplus value that they generate for the Russians results in the accretion of wealth to China uh, in some medium of exchange that's spendable and convertible. I, I think the Chinese see uh, a couple things. At one point in time, they had $4 trillion in U.S. treasuries. And I think that they see increasingly complex, <laughs> an increasingly complex, complex arithmetic, arithmetic outcome to that, uh, which is to say the U.S. dollar at today's interest rates, U.S. Treasury securities aren't a good deal. I think that's one thing they see. The second thing they see is the increasing willingness of the United States to debase the dollar, both as a store of value and a medium of exchange. The U.S. government specifically enforces sanctions uh, against third parties on third parties, which is to say the U.S. government uses the SWIFT banking system to manage relationships as an example between Belgium and Iran. Uh, the Chinese don't see themselves as being beneficiaries of this. They see themselves as being victims of this. At the same time, because the renminbi is only partially convertible, China's trade partners might prefer to be paid in gold. And I'm sure that the Chinese, were they dealing with an example, with as an example, the South Africans or the Iranians, would be pre preferred to be paid in gold rather than being paid in rands or rials, respectively. Exactly the same reason. I think gold is a store of value and a medium of exchange. Uh, I own it as insurance purposes. I'm not one of those guys who cares particularly about whether the gold price is at 2400 or 2500 uh, I'm not interested in a 3% move in the gold price. Uh, I am afraid, uh, and that's exactly the right word, I am afraid that we will have a crisis of confidence uh, against U.S. Treasuries that will cause the dollar to deteriorate enough that my gold sells for $8,000 or $9,000 or $10,000. Ben, that isn't the circumstance I look forward to. I don't own gold in hopes of capital gains. I own gold as a form of insurance. If you think about gold as insurance and you think about how you get paid on insurance, you get paid when something lousy happens. Life insurance means somebody died. Auto insurance means you had a wreck. House insurance means you had a fire or a theft. I don't want any of those things to occur, but if they do occur, I want to get paid. So I don't want to see a crisis in confidence around fiat currency denominated savings products. I don't want to see that. But I think that there's a possibility that it occurs. And given that there's a possibility that it occurs and given that I can afford it, uh, I want insurance. I began systematically acquiring gold for the third time in my life in 1998 and in the period well 1998 was two years too early you know my 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 first experience well my experience in this round of accumulation my first two years uh, I consistently lost purchasing power by purchasing gold but in the period uh, 2000 to now uh, that gold has appreciated for me against the U.S. dollar uh, by about 8%, 8.5% compounded, which is to say it's done its job. I've maintained my purchasing power in gold where I wouldn't have maintained my purchasing power in U.S. dollars. Uh, so gold has acted in my own portfolio precisely the way that I hoped it would act. Uh, I remember in 1987, again in 2008, when the broad markets fell precipitously, the gold quote held up for a day. <laughs> uh, in a liquidity crisis, everything gets sold. What is also true, though, is that good assets snap back. And in both circumstances, the gold price for those who are willing to hold at eight weeks snapped back. In other words, it fulfilled its insurance function. I think other people hold gold for other reasons. There are people who are speculators who look back at the price history of gold and they note that every now and then the, the upward price performance of gold is extraordinary. Um, I 
wonder whether those people are skilled enough to speculate in gold at once managing their own emotions and their own patience uh, while also understanding uh, macroeconomics enough to time their purchases and sales intelligently. I know I'm not. Uh, as I say, I don't own gold in the quest for capital gains. I will admit I own some silver in the quest for capital gains, but not enough that if I'm wrong, it changes my decision as to what to have for breakfast. I don't need to speculate to get rich because I already did that. <laughs> uh, I speculate more for laughs now. Uh, about two and a half percent of my portfolio is silver centric. If past is prologue, that two and a half percent might become 25 percent without any more additions, which is to say the upside around the silver stocks when they run is truly, truly, truly stupid. I don't know if they're going to run and if they do when they're going to run. I just know that a couple times before this time in my career that my portfolio of silver and high quality silver stocks has given me a 10 bagger. Uh, and it would amuse me to see that happen again. So I'm in place for it to happen. I don't even understand why it happens, because when I try to study past silver price movements, the fact that only 17% of primary silver comes from silver mines, the rest comes from recycling uh, and is a byproduct of other metals, means that the new mine supply is very, very, very tough to figure out. Two, the above ground inventories of silver uh, are very difficult to ascertain because so much silver is hoarded by poor people, particularly in India, Pakistan, Bangladesh, Sri Lanka, the people who hoard it because they're afraid of their government. So of course they don't want to declare it. <laughs> and that means that silver supply uh, is tough to forecast. Uh, one part of silver demand, which is to say industrial demand around things like water treatment, uh, germicides and in particular reflective solar products uh, is not that difficult uh, to forecast with some certainty. But understanding the nature of a silver market uh, involves understanding something about investor and speculative psychology, which I'm not very good at. Uh, so while I'm not sure I'm going to be right this time, uh, I'm sure enough to make what is for me a relatively small bet uh, based on my own historical observations. Uh, again, past observation. Uh, I've tried to say when I'm in interviews like this that I might be wrong uh, or that the reaction might be delayed. I remember, Ben, uh, the first bull market that I participated in, 1970 to 1980. I didn't participate as much as I wished because I was very young, I had no experience. At the beginning of the bull market, I had no money. <laughs> but I watched one little silver stock, Coeur d'Alene, go from 10 cents to $65, sadly without my participation. That let me understand the incredible upside volatility around silver. The fact that I could deploy a fairly small part of my portfolio if I was willing to do a lot of work and enjoy stupid upside. The consequence of that is that when the silver price was really depressed in the last part, later part of the decade of the 80s, I assisted two great entrepreneurs, uh, Bob Quartermain and Ross Beatty, uh, in founding Silver Standard and Pan American Silver, respectively. Uh, and although, by historic standards, that bull market uh, in silver, $4 to $50, was fairly muted, I guess a 10 bagger isn't muted, <laughs> but compared to the 70s, it was muted. Uh, the performance in those two stocks, silver standard, 72 cents to $45, Pan American silver, 50 cents to $45. What that told me is that given my own tolerance for volatility, my patience, and my willingness to work harder than my competition, uh, understanding the value proposition around individual silver stocks, meant that I could enjoy really, truly disproportionate returns.